Wow. Okay. You all can go home now because you've heard it all. There's nothing more to say. And my grandmother, who is watching from way up high, her comment to that introduction would be, but can you still clean a good, the house well, you know? And are you still uh, respectful to others, you know? So don't let it go to your head, whatever Judas said. So I'd like to begin uh, with bowing in. And uh, first, first, this is the bow that, that we all know is our, the bow of the host lineage. Then I'd like to invite you to join me in the bow of my Zen lineage. And then I'm going to invite you to join me in a bow that might not be known universally, but I believe it ought to be, which is from my blood lineage. And I'd like you to do this with yourselves. Ah, un abrazo, que rico. <laughs> and on that note, let us begin our time together. Please enjoy. Whether you're different, same ignorant or intelligent Whether you tell the truth, lie or embellish it Whether you live in gratitude or for the hell of it It doesn't really matter, we're still one single fellowship Whether you've been lustful or living celibate Whether you're an optimist or only see the negative Whether you're dead, broke or rich from inheritance Doesn't really matter, we're made of the same sediment Whether you got a family or single parenting Or you're Asian, African, European or American Whether you pray to God or atheist is irrelevant Cause what you got inside is the same as so keep it now, it'll change your heart, it'll change your mind, and then you'll start to change. So keep it now, everything you touch, everyone you see, will soon become your family. Do you see yourself in the troubled in the home? Can you say everywhere you are is where your home is? Sharing your heart in the dark just like a lotus Letting your light shine bright so you can flow this Everlasting love of grace like those did Jesus, Muhammad, Krishna, Buddha, and Moses Who carried the weight of the world upon their shoulders So every time you fall down, go ahead and hold this Close to your heart cause you're a love soldier And every time you get a chance, you pay it forward Moving closer to heaven's gates, we're all soaring Because of you, love is where we're so headed towards
keep on trying, gotta keep on caring, gotta keep the light on through dark and despair, gotta spread the love where nobody cares, gotta keep on loving, gotta keep on sharing, gotta keep on trying, gotta keep on caring, gotta keep the light on through dark and despair. So at the end of the talk, you let me know um, why do you think I started with this, yes? So what I'd like you to do now is to let your eyes go wherever they want. Just let your eyes go wherever they want in, this, in the room. Right? Just let them go. And as, and as you're doing that, as your eyes go where they want to, just notice something pleasant. And just take a note of that. Notice what you're drawn to that is pleasant. And as you notice where your eyes land that is pleasant, Please bring that into your body. See where it lands in your body. And allow that to spread throughout your entire body. And just notice. And now on your next inhale, just come back into the room. And now notice others in the room. Really notice others in the room. And just notice what that's like. Yeah. So recalling uh, Shogyan Trungpa Rinpoche, when he talked about the tantric path, as he talked about it as the sky turning to, into a huge, giant, blue pancake and dropping on our heads. Right. Wow. Right. So, so let's just imagine this gigantic sky descending on our heads. And at the same time, Rinpoche said that it creates an enormous space at the same time. Right. So I'm, I'm inviting you to allow yourself and the body to inhabit that enormous space for the time that we're together in the next hour or so. I want to introduce the, the topic, the body, legacy, trauma, and global transformation, a bio-spiritual approach. And I want to continue with a quote from Rinpoche. It's part of a longer quote that he said, since all things are naked, clear, and free from obscurations, there's nothing to attain or realize. Right. So then what are we doing here? Right. We could be floating up in that big blue pancake, the sky. Yet, Tanishi Coates, the National Book Award winner of Between the World and Me, a book that has been said offers a powerful new framework for understanding our nation's history and current crisis. And Tanishi does this 
through the black body, he tells us, and I quote, and still you're, call, you're called to struggle, not because it assures you victory, but because it assures you an honorable and sane life. And then some master Dogen says, reminding us that the way is intrinsically accomplished. The principle of Zen is complete freedom. Right? So we're in great company, great lineage. So my intention is to begin a conversation on what is required to fully manifest a multiracial, multicultural, enlightened society. What I'm sharing with you today is just a perspective on how we might engage towards a liberation with capital L trajectory. It is my wish to provoke, excite, challenge, and awaken your body mind to the next level of engagement. Only you'll be able to sense if I've, if I've succeeded. Or, as Dr. Maya Angelo said, hoping for the best, prepare for the worst, and unsurprised by anything in between. Right? So contemplative somatic wellness is my integration of somatic experiencing with the essence of sense of Zen and the theory of emancipatory consciousness, a sociopolitical and cultural framework for healing internalized oppression as foundational to the renegotiation of and healing of trauma. This trifle integration of SE plus Zen plus EC, lately in my old age, I've gotten into like equations for some reason, <laughs> brings a biospiritual modality, biology plus spirit equals existence, into the field for the resolution of individual, collective, and what I, my partner coined legacy trauma. I assured her that I would give her credit, even though I stole the term. Right? So I want to tell you why I do this work. My experience being exposed to the notion that liberation in this lifetime is indeed possible was my meeting Dr. Erika Sherover Marcusa. Her life was tragically short, dying at 50 in 1988. She was a white Jewish working class red diaper baby, philosopher and social theorist and activist, fluent in several languages, and the last wife of Herbert Marcuse, a German American sociologist and political theorist connected with the Frankfurt School, a sociopolitical and philosophical movement that was the source of what is now known as critical theory. Herbert Marcuse was called in the media in the 1960s, the father of the new left. And he was also the mentor of Angela Davis. And it was through Erica Marcuse that I met uh, Angela Davis. It had been a dream of mine since I was in high school. So I met Erica Sherwin Marcuse, known to her family and friends as Ricky, in 1983. From the moment we met, she showed me an intimate path to personal freedom by exposing me to her brilliant analysis of the teaching of internalized oppression and internalized domination. In her now classic Marxist theoretical analysis of the phenomenon of systems of domination titled Emancipation and Consciousness, Dogmatic and Dialectical Perspective in the Early Marx, which was published in uh, uh, 1986, a couple years before she died. Ricky Marcusa tells us, I quote, in the natural cycle, and she placed natural cycle in quotations, of oppression, those who have been victims tend to become perpetrators. Although individuals have choices within socially pre-existing roles of victim and perpetrator, these roles themselves are recreated and imposed on new generations of human beings through the normal mechanisms of an oppressive society. Her working assumption was that people would not deliberately mistreat or cooperate 
with the socially sanctioned mistreatment of others unless they themselves have been previously mistreated. Such an assumption implies that the very real positive reinforcement, the material benefits and social rewards that individual in any oppressor role receives in exchange for cooperating with such socialization would not in themselves be sufficient to secure their cooperation with an oppressive system. She staunchly believed that this assumption can also be expressed in the claim that all oppressors have themselves been oppressed. She went on to create a very powerful process work called Unlearning Racism Workshops. And it was in that, uh, that context that I first met her. And she saw this as one step process. First I met, joined her as a student and then a colleague and peer and co-facilitator. Ricky literally changed my life. Mm -hmm. And one, uh, and this is how she began to do that. Uh, I had never met a white person who was so relentless in interrupting the internalized oppression and internalized domination of the people of color that she met. And uh, so one time uh, we were, she had invited me to co-lead uh, a workshop with her where it was both people of color and white people. And at a certain point of the workshop, we would then uh, separate into two groups. And while before we separated, I was supposed to do a piece. And this was at the University of California, Davis at the law school. And in front of a large audience, I completely froze. Now I understand what was happening. I didn't then. My body just decided to go somewhere else. Right? I don't assume anyone here has ever had that experience. <laughs> and so she witnessed it, moved right in, and picked up, you know, it was seamless. Right? Afterwards, I began to apologize, and she quickly interrupted me and said, no, it, this is not about you not being uh, brilliant, because that was my thing. I, I wasn't smart enough to like step up to it. She said, no, this is not about you not being brilliant or intelligent. This is about you being terrified of letting others know just how completely brilliant you are. Took me a while to get there, but uh, that was the beginning. Another example, uh, because it still lives in my heart, was that in another situation where I was caught in this cage of, you know, I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough, you know. Here, uh, Ricky said to me, and here she was, to me, was like an incredible, brilliant intellectual. She said, remember, you're smarter than any Jew any day. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand what that was. It took me a while. But it was that internalized place within myself that felt that smartness, intellectual lineage, brilliant ideas belong with this realm, just with this realm of people. And here she was, a representative of that group, saying that to me. I think she might have added, you're smarter than any Jewish man any day. Right. <laughs> that, that was the piece, yeah. So not only did she challenge the internalized racism, she challenged the internalized sexism. You with me? Yeah, okay. <clears throat> so first, um, through the, my relationship with Ricky and decades later, as I walked the path of Zen, I discovered the cages that I inhabited. And though trapped in these cages, I was like the bird Sister Maya told us about when she said, the cage bird sings with a fearful trill of things unknown but long for still. And his tune is heard on the distant hill for the cage bird sings of freedom. 
That is a song that lives in every human being's heart, in every human being's body. Mm -hmm. And in spite of more than 30 years with the Dharma, the center of my life, there were still some cages whose doors had not completely swung open in this very body. <clears throat> Finally, six years ago, again through my spouse, <laughs> Araku Handor, who is my heart teacher, uh, I came to somatic experiencing. And also through karmic conditions. I've been told about this like years ago. and it, it, it never came into my life until through the door of, of, of our relationship. And through this teachings and practice, I began what is to be, I began to taste what is to be liberated from the cages of internalized oppression and external domination. Liberated from cages that are trauma vortices. And though not in the present, these trauma vortices remain alive in our bodies. A body left unhealed will continue to recreate at the personal, interpersonal, cultural, and structural levels, cages for itself and for others. With, without investigating and embodying this deep approach that I'm beginning to share with you at a, at a very personal level, we cannot possibly aspire to an impact societal change. And that is revolutionary intimacy. One of the fundamental teachings of Buddhism and Zen is the law of karma. What we do in the present determines the course of our future development. The late Dr. Chik Chin An, the founder of the International Buddhist Meditation Center in Los Angeles, California, uh, spoke of karma in that way. And that was a quote of his. When I first encountered the teaching of karma in the Zen path, Zen Buddhist path, I realized that the fundamental inquiry in my life, and I propose that it might be an inquiry you might want to explore, is what am I doing in the present? Right. Sounds simple, but what am I doing in the present? It is this present that is the casual determinant of what has already transpired and what might unfold. Recognizing this with a profound depth of feeling in my own body, I committed to taking care of business right now. Right. And that so-called business is the business of healing this heap. Right. So that may embody the teachings as a conduit to the alleviation of suffering for all beings, including and most important, and the one that often gets forgotten, this very one, right? the one that inhabits this human body. So uh, Stephen Porges, Dr. Stephen Porges, uh, how many of you have heard of Stephen Porges? I think he, he was a speaker here at Naropa some years back. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the, he was the, the, he's the developer of the polyvagal theory. He talks about coming home to our bodies. And for Porges, he says, and I quote, home is a powerful metaphor for safety. So we come back to our bodies as home, and that's a powerful metaphor for safety. And safety is primordial for humans to experience a sense of wholeness, beingness, wellness, and the birthright to take our seat in this interconnected universe. By doing so, we're free. Our bodies will embody freedom, and in the midst of ever-present inequities and injustice, we will be able to offer freedom to others. 
to shift the metaphor, which is so prevalent if you identify as a social change activist, which I did have, and I'm attempting to, to not be caught in that, but I still have that identity. We need to shift the metaphor from changing the world to healing the world. To be healed in the body is an act of rebellion. And Albert Camus said, the only way to deal with an unfree world is to become so absolutely free that your very existence is an act of rebellion. Let me read that one again. <laughs> the only way to deal with an unfree world is to become so absolutely free that your very existence is an act of rebellion. Right? Powerful. Right? Again, according to Porges, and um, this is a quote, it, it's, and it might be a little long, it's more than four lines, but I, I think it's important. What we need to understand is that the nervous system is really requesting familiarity and predictability. So we're talking biology here now. Familiarity and predictability, which is a metaphor for safety. We have to re-understand what it is to be a human being. Part of being a human being is to be dependent upon another human. Not all the time, of course. Similar to most mammals, we come into the world with great dependence on our caregivers. And that need to connect and be connected to others remains throughout our lives. As we mature, we need to find safe environments so that we can sleep, eat, defecate, reproduce. We create the safe environments by building walls to create boundaries and privacy. And this is the one I love because I relate to this. Or we may get a dog, right? <laughs> Which will guard us as we sleep. The point of these strategies is to create an environment in which we no longer need to be hypervigilant and to allow us to participate in life, in the life processes that require safe environments, social engagement behaviors, making eye contact, listening to people or animals or all kinds of beings that we don't even see, requires that we go we give up hypervigilance. Right? What I discovered in my early career, uh, professional career, and also later in my SEM practice, if, for example, we talk about racism, you know, as one of the streams of suffering in in our world, that as a person of color. Being hypervigilant is core, is core to legacy trauma. For example, constantly scanning the environment to see if it's safe. It's done unconsciously, but it's there. It's in the nervous system, right? And for a white person, to continue the example of talking about racism as one of the streams of suffering. The residual core of legacy trauma manifests in freeze and disassociation. For example, not noticing differences and their impact is disassociation. Or when witnessing uh, racially motivated behavior and wanting to do something and yet failing to interrupt that's freeze. I had the, the privilege, honor, and benefit in my professional career outside of Zen, I would say outside of Dharma, but everything is in the Dharma, uh, that I worked always in a multiracial, uh, cross racial, cross gender, cross sexual orientation teams. And it was an intentional strategy with the organization that I was a consultant with because of knowing that uh, so much comes in through subliminal messages. Right? 
So I off, uh, my partners for at least 10, 15 years was either white heterosexual men or a uh, white lesbian woman. And intentional because um, when I work with my uh, white heterosexual male partner, I was the lead. So in front of a room of predominantly 90, 99.9% .9 uh, white audience, there was an experiential uh, uh, process where the audience, for many, the very first times in their lives, would see a white man take leadership from a woman of color. Are you with me? Yeah. So, one, uh, my, uh, and I work with a man named Cooper Thompson who lives in uh, Europe, and he, as a heterosexual man, he did tremendous amount of work, and he has, um, he has a, a book uh, where he interviewed 35, I believe, white men who committed their lives to ending racism. Um, he, uh, and he also uh, worked uh, very much within uh, the community uh, uh, working to end um, homophobia, both as a member outside of those groups. And it was my colleague and dear friend, Dr. Sarah Stearns, when talking about this piece of not noticing among white people, the disassociation and the freeze, she said, it's like, speaking of herself, she says, it's me as a white woman walking into a room which is predominantly white and not asking, how come this is so? So the impact of having evolved as humans within the system of domination in which we live has left in our bodies a wired way of being in the world, which manifests, whether we wish or not, in fear, competition, mistrust, and on and on and on. Feeling unsafe. According to Ricky, this is, and I quote, the semi-autonomous nature of the consequences of oppression. That is, and I quote, the patterns of thought and action inculcated through the experience of oppression take on a substantiality and a life of their own. There's another quote I want to share with you before I close and, uh, and open to questions. Because um, this is one of the key things that she taught me. She taught me about the materiality or the sedimented nature of mystified consciousness. She was a Marxist. <laughs> that mystified consciousness is not merely a set of false ideas or illusions, but that it encompasses modes of being, ways of acting, and of experiencing oneself and one's existence to which people have become accustomed attached, and even addicted. And she put addicted in quotes, at an affective level. This sedimentation of mystified consciousness congeals into character structures and personality types. Naturalized and normalized cages for the individuals who inhabit them. The habits engendered by domination become forms of life through which individuals reproduce the system of domination. <clears throat> so th this project that I'm, and I look at it as a project in, in this lifetime that I'm talking with you about, and it's a project that I didn't plan to take on, and it's a project that then I can also say, I didn't plan on taking it on, but I had no choice. Right. To, so to the, to the ends of this project, we must learn the skills of healing the generational trauma that lives in our bodies. Right. The technology to deconstruct the stories we carry in our heads. And the science that shows us how change is possible right here and right now. It is only through this biospiritual integration that we, and I'm, I'm 
putting myself in the, in the generation of uh, over 60, right? and, as, and, and sort of paraphrase His Holiness the Dalai Lama when he now in his 80s, he says, you know, he's dying. The, you know, the, the work we do to impact society and the world it, is not for his benefit or his generation because he's on his way out. So I've begun to uh, try that teaching on as uh, the dying generation, right? different from, you know, and this is going to date me, the Pepsi generation, right? So, so for us, you know, uh, this integration is, is, is crucial, right? Because this dying, so that we as the dying generation will be able to nurture and guide those who are coming after us. And I see some of those faces here, right? Those who come after us, who will be the visionary leaders that our planet urgently is uh, calling forth at this time. Right? And in closing, it is a time in our human history and global situation when only individuals who are whole, healthy, and free can foster a body-mind-centered movement for spiritual activism that is grounded in clearly seeing the dynamics that continue to perpetuate the present system of inequality, injustice, environmental destruction. It will be the only way that comprehensive, effective, and sustainable social change will be achieved. Perhaps a still unknown, authentic, authentic yet exciting way wave of revolutionary social change. A social change that Ricky Marcusa used to envision as a social change with a true human face. And Herbert Marcusa was so significant beyond words to Ricky that I want to end with two of his quotes that I came across recently. There is no free society without silence without the internal and external spaces of solitude in which the individual freedom can develop. And his, this next quote, which I think is prescient perhaps of the political environment in which it's happening right now, he said, free election of masters does not abolish the masters or, their, or the slaves. Thank you very much. And if you'd be so kind to say who you are, to bring your voice into the space, energy. Yeah, um, my name is Sarah. Sarah. And uh, I'm an alum, and I teach here at Naropa. And I kind of have a, a long question. <laughs> so maybe I'll just read it to you, and then we can discuss. Um, you'd said that freedom is an act of rebellion, um, kind of paraphrasing here. And I was wondering... I think my main question is, what is meant by free? Um, what is meant by that word? And perhaps that means, what is true liberation? Um, I'm thinking about freedom from suffering uh, in the Buddhist sense, but I don't know if, for me, as a, a queer female person of color, if that's possible in my lifetime. But you do think it is possible. Um, <laughs> I... Uh, I guess I'm stuck a little bit on that um, because one of the things you talked about as a way to achieve freedom is, for instance, to give up hypervigilance. And you gave the example of having to scan a room to make sure it was safe. Um, I don't know how to give that up because if I don't give, if I give that up, I might not survive in the society we live in. Um, so 
if you could perhaps speak to that about what is meant by free or what is meant by liberation. Yes. That's beautiful. You. you encapsulate it. Um, it let me just clarify the, what I said about hypervigilance. It's not about having to give it up. It's when hypervigilance rules and controls my way of being in the world, which then uh, sets up the, the equation, if you want to say, that then I don't have a choice. And choice is the fundamental uh, variable in freedom, right? when I have a choice. So recognizing that the way the world appears to me is an unsafe world, and it's not just an appearance. Right? Uh, I want to bring in here uh, uh, a Buddhist teaching of the relative and the absolute. So I'm going to do my best to respond to your question from that lens. So, you know, there's, how many of you are familiar with that teaching? Yeah. So, so in the relative world, right, when I look at myself in the mirror, this is the package I see. Right? Um, I don't know if I've shared this with anyone since I've been here, but in the relative world, uh, when I often have walked into a room to be the speaker or presenter, uh, people stand around waiting for the speaker, the presenter to come in the room. Right? So, so that happens, right? The piece that is fundamental in, in experiencing the freedom is recognizing that that's happening. Right? And having done the work at a physiological level, which has to do with really working with the nervous system, as to how do I in that moment metabolize the transgression that had just occurred without taking away the wholeness that I know is here. Right? So in the relative world, it's a very unsafe world for a queer female of color. There's no question about that. Right? Uh, it's, it's like when I moved to Northampton, um, one morning, uh, my, who's now my spouse, was, uh, we were running a little late to work, and I said, why don't I drive you? Because uh, she was running out and couldn't find her license. And as soon as I, I was down the road, a police car pulled, you know, and pulled me over. That happened uh, probably in the first month and a half that I moved to Northampton, three times pulled over. At the time, my hair, I wore a shaved head and dark glasses. And the third time, uh, when I didn't know why I was being pulled over, the first thing, the officer, a white male, came up and said, do you speak English? So in that moment, I was, um, and that was before SC. However, I had my Dharma practice. So when he got done, took my license, and went back to, um, to his patrol car, and I had called my spouse because I was very close to her office. And I said, I just want you to know I just got pulled over in the center of Northampton. I don't know what's going on. You know, 10 minutes later, he comes back up, hands me my license and says, do you have any questions for me? And I said, yes, I do. And he kind of, and now I understand what happens because through the SE lens, uh, when I engage with individuals, it's not just personality. I'm watching the entire nervous system, he pulled back. And I said, yes, I want to know if everyone you stop, you ask them if they speak English. And he had a, he had a response. He, uh, you know, he stammered and said it and walked away. So I'm sharing, you know, I wasn't planning on sharing that example. It's, it's been channeled right now, because that's a reality. But at the same time, it's doing this very fundamental primordial work that is not a, um, and I might step into icy waters here with, a, with Al in the room, because I'm going to talk about the brain. <laughs> but you can help me if I, yeah. It's not a, 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 front, a, a neocortex, right? This is, the, the healing that needs to happen does not happen at the neocortex level, right? So, 
So those, this is what arises for me uh, in, in hearing your question. And are you willing to entertain a question from me? Yes. Yeah. So in the midst of the relative, right, there's all, uh, you also understand the teaching of the absolute. Yes. When you embody that teaching, do you feel free? I, I think I don't, I haven't figured out the teaching for myself yet. Fair enough, fair enough. I can understand it, like you said, neo, like prefrontal cortex, yes. but yeah. not, not, I can't feel it in my body. In the, beautiful. Now that's a powerful awareness. Right. Let me say something about the absolute. Um, and, it, and, and this is, might get me in hot water and it's being, I was told it's it been videoed and it'll be on the Naropa website and it's like, <laughs> Okay, now, um, this is the time to be naughty then, right? <laughs> in particularly in Buddhist environments, for those, who are, uh, those of us who are in a dominant group of privilege and rank, we love the teaching of the absolute because the Buddha said we're all one. Then for those of us who are not in positions of power, rank, or privilege, it seems like the only thing that's left for us is the teaching of the relative. But as I understand, in my, in my limited understanding of Nagarjuna, it's not that uh, you know, we have to choose between the relative and the absolute. And here I'm also stepping into deep waters with Judith in the room, right? It's more, how do I live, my interpretation, how do I live in the relative world with the lens of the absolute? And that's freedom, right? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for your question. Hello? Hey. Hi. Thank Hi. you for standing. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Would you tell, like tell me your name? Uh, Brian Otto Kimmel. Um, I'm a musician and a student and alum here. I'm in the graduate somatic counseling mm. here, so I'm familiar with SC. I took beginning training. But oh, you did beginning training? Yeah. And you offered me tea. And I offered you tea. I was going to say if you would like some. <laughs> I don't have the water, but. <laughs> <laughs> this is good tea. Okay, good. <laughs> Uh, I have a question about uh, Dharma, uh, the book. Uh, yes. About the Dharma, color, and Dharma culture. color and culture. I I read it a, a while back ago, yes. and I talked with the publisher if there would be a new edition, and I'm wondering what would be added in the current, uh, you know, if there were a new edition, who, what kind of authors would be added, and in the context of the culture of Dharma now and discussions of race. Uh, intersectionality, what would be included, what would be added? I don't, mm. I don't remember when it was published. Maybe 204. 204, okay. Mm -hmm. So a lot of language has changed since then, um, so I'm wondering just your feedback on that. Well, f what first arises is I would love for you to be the next editor. Great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on it. No, uh, I'm good. Yeah, no, we'll talk. Um, thank you for the question. It is not often... Um, that I get questions on Dharma, color, and culture. In the process of this publication, I could say a lot about it as it exemplify the issues we're talking about here today. Um, well, I, I've had a, uh, first of all, um, I own the copyright to Dharma, color, and culture, so that's something that I understand it's important, you know, if, if a new edition is going to come. Uh, in our Two Stream Zen website, uh, we have the introductory chapter as a PDF. And also, there was a link to go directly to the publisher for people who wanted to purchase it. And just last year, I received feedback from some Sangha members that they went to purchase it and they can't find it. Which is, which is fascinating because there's at least two copies at Trident Bookstore 
in downtown Boulder. Right? So it's, it's around. So I went to the website, it, and it's out of print, by the way. It's out of print. At the time that I was informed, which was, this was 2004, probably in 2008, I was informed that the publisher, or whoever the powers that are, I don't know anything about book publishing, uh, they were going to like get rid of their inventory. Uh, they offered me to buy all the copies, but I and the community around me, we didn't have the investments to do that. So, so when I was notified recently that people couldn't get it through the publisher, I went to the publisher's website, and then I wonder if I forget, remind me, tell me the anecdote, because I just, there's a connection, another karmic connection here. Um, and it doesn't appear anywhere, and my name doesn't appear anywhere, which is the lesser of the two, you know. But what it does appear is that the term Dharma, color, and culture has been appropriated and it's become a category of that publishing house. So there's lots of books now under Dharmic Culture. So this was probably December of last year when I discovered this, uh, not to 2015, 2014. I was visiting a friend in San Francisco who's an attorney, though she, well, she, she's a lawyer and at the same, but professionally she's a massage therapist. <laughs> Robin Barnett, but her tag is, I can do your body justice, right? <laughs> <laughs> so we, I consulted and did some research and it turns out, and, um, and there, there might be people here who've been published who know more about this, that book titles are not copyrighted. So, so that's that, that part of the book. In terms of if it was happening today, I wouldn't, be the one to edit it. Right? I would want to have, um, there's def different ideas that came through the years. What would it be if there was a, another volume? Because this was the first volume uh, by teachers and students of color talking about uh, how the Four Noble Truth have impacted their lives around the issue of racism. And that was a very strategic choice I've never done this before. And my editor at the time, who's now the publisher of Parallax, I knew her when she was a child because she was Ricky Marcuse's niece. And I hadn't seen her for a long time. She'd grown up, she'd come east to go to school. And when I see Rachel Newman, I said, wait a minute, that's Rainbow, you know, that's what her, we used to know her. So, so she, she uh, shepherded me and uh, mid midwife me through this. Um, and I was told, you need, um, you need to have a framework for the book. I said to Parallax, I'm not going to write, a, they first wanted to hear, have people of color tell our stories about how it is to live with racism. I said, that's quite boring to me, and it's not interesting. And now, from a SE perspective, any time I talk about what it has been like for me, the amygdala doesn't know that what I'm sharing is not happening right now. Ergo, why SCs become now very much part of talk therapy circles, because every time I tell a story, it, you know, the, the nervous system doesn't know it's not happening now, and it gets traumatized. So I said, you know, what I'm interested more is how the teachings impact our lives. That's what is, was happening for me. So I had a friend, uh, Shotai de la Rosa was a Colombian, a Soto Zen priest, and um, we were, uh, she was a smoker, and we're sitting on the roof of San Francisco Zen Center, and I said to her, well, maybe, maybe I should uh, frame it around the, the Brahma Viharas, you know? Why not? Loving kindness, you know, compassion, Sympathetic joy, equanimity. She said, and, and if you knew her, you, you could just see, I can hear it. She says, no, you don't want to do that because that's become a sentimental thing here in the West. Right? And then we looked at each other and I said, the Four Noble Truth. You know, so <laughs> what else is there? So that's how it was. That was that. So now, uh, does it, 
you know, I thought the follow-up uh, volume of being a volume of both uh, of white Dharma teachers speaking of what it's like to be white and the teachings of the Dharma in their lives as a lens and a beam to shed light on whiteness and uh, power, rank, and privilege. So that came a few years ago. That would be another, another volume. And then I think it would be a wonderful thing, like I started saying, if you would be the next editor. And I'd love to hear what your interest is. It can happen, you know. <laughs> Did I respond to your inquiry? Yes, very good, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Without notes, I can go on and on and on. <laughs> Yes. My question is following. Oh yes. My question is following up on the earlier um, question about living in the relative world with the view of the absolute and not not falling to one extreme or the other. Yes. And I don't know much about somatic experiencing except what I learned from Tommy Woon just yes. in uh, some period of time. Can you comment on how somatic experiencing helps you do that mm -hmm. and how Zen practice helps you do that? It, it's, uh, I'm asking a how question. A how question. How both Zen, how each Zen and somatic experience helps in not falling into extremes. That's right, not falling into just living in the relative hypervigilance or spiritually bypassing mm, into the mm -hmm, absolute. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, what, the first thing that arises is that the teachings of Zen, like teachings of the Dharma, is it's all about here and now. It's the present, it's seeing what's arising, uh, the experience that's arising, the appearances that are arising. And, and, and knowing that and being able to embody that at a deep level uh, maintains a pretty balanced uh, movement through those, extreme, those two streams. And with the SC, what I found is uh, that it's, it's, it's purely physiological. That was what drew me when I first saw uh, the first a little video that uh, the, the faculty that came in to do an intro. Uh, it's, for some reason, what comes up for me to say right now to your question is that physiology is like, it, it goes beyond whatever habits, conditions, um, stories, right? It's how this, you know, it's sort of like that, uh, the equation biology plus spirit equals existence. You know, it's like uh, my nervous system will go into a re response, a reaction, without the neocortex even knowing why that happens. Right. So, so trusting, trusting in that physiology, is helping me maintain that even path or that balanced path. So, SE doesn't take you too much into the relative. Only. SE gives you also access to the absolute at the same time? For me. For you. For me, it does because it's, it's like right here. Right here. So, therefore, when I work with someone in my private practice, I don't need to know the history of the trauma. It, it, you know, it m might come up later and can be used in the, in the healing process, but it's basically with what's right here. So an example was when I asked you and others in the audience, just let your eyes go where they want. And notice if it's what's pleasant. Right? Rather than look around the room. That's an important. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so it's now time. It's now time. Okay, thank you. So... Um, I don't know if anyone has guessed uh, why I showed the first video, but uh, I'm going to close now with showing you this one, uh, and then we'll say goodbye. 
And I want to thank Jason Davis for his support in making this presentation happen. <laughs>